Hello and welcome to our Lakeside Chat. We are David Wofford and Katie Noonan, co-chairs of the Rotary Nature Center Friends. And we're so happy that you can join us tonight. As we begin our program, it is important for us to acknowledge that we are on stolen land, that Lake Merritt is part of Ohlone territory. We hear now from Corinna Gould, spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashawn and co-founder of Segurate Land Trust. Good afternoon, relatives. My name is Karina Gould. I am the spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashawn. We are here today at what most folks think of as Lake Merritt. Uh, we are in the territory of Huchin. Huchin is actually a territory that encompasses six Bay Area cities, Oakland, Berkeley, Alameda, Emeryville, Albany, and Piedmont. And so this is a place that my ancestors have been since the beginning of time and this was a place of abundance. I'm so happy that people from all walks of life that now come into our territory can enjoy this beautiful place that my ancestors have enjoyed since the beginning of time. My relationship to the land, the land that I have been born to, raising my children and grandchildren here, has been to tell the story, the truth, of what happened on this land before other people came here. I'm hoping that as we begin to learn these lessons of fires in California, the pandemic that's happening, that human beings come back to living in reciprocity with the earth. Hello everyone, David Wofford with the Rotary Nature Center friends, inviting you to come down the third Saturday of each month from 10 to 2 and join us here at Lake Mary while we're doing our trash and litter cleanup. But also, we'll be doing a variety of things, such as uh, native plant identification, plant identifications and water testings, and uh, uh, examining and identifying organisms from Lake Merritt. So come on down and join us. Be sure to bring the family and friends. The third Saturday of each month from 10 to 2. And we'll have a great time. So tonight, um, we have some special guests from the Rose Foundation's New Voices Arising program. Um, these are the externs who have spent some time with Rotary Nature Center friends at Lake Merritt as part of an internship program. So without any further delay, I would like to introduce them and share my screen so that um, they can tell you about what they have been doing. Hey everyone, we're the Rotary Nature Center friends externs. I'm Angela and we are also joined by Miriam, Diana and Michelle. We're interns with New Voices Arising, and that's an internship that brings together youth from all over the Bay to learn more about social and environmental justice issues that we face. Thanks to our internship, we're able to be externs here at Lake Merritt with the Rotary Nature Center, and we've developed into community scientists, and we're able to learn more about our communities and how diverse our area is. Some of the activities that we have been doing at Lake Merritt is going <laughs> to the bird sanctuary and making posters about the birds and hanging them up. So when people pass by, they could read about um, the birds that are at Lake Merritt. Um, we also tested the water quality, um, how salty, deep, clear the water is, and you got to see different organisms living in the water. Um, we, used, we also used an app called iNaturalist and contribu contributed to a real data project by the California Academy of Science. And here are some posters that we did about the scrub gate and the song sparrow. Okay, so here we have two pictures of the community uh, trying to restore the marsh. Um, they planted hundreds of pickle weeds, but none of them really grew that well. So um, us externs decided to do a soil experiment so soil is made up of a mixture of sand, silt, clay, and rotted plant material. So the JAR soil experiment helped us understand what the proportions of these mixtures uh, for the soil we worked with from Lake Merritt. So here we have a mason jar uh, filled with soil. And on the right, the image shows um, the silt, fine sand, uh, the coarse sand, gravel, and... Um, we did this experiment with different parts uh, in Lake Merritt. Here, um, we did an experiment in the water line, the cages area, mid-marsh, first pickle weeds. 
<clears throat> Oakland established pickleweeds in, in the backyard garden in Oakland. And we found out that um, the soil by the cages were almost exactly the same as um, Upland uh, established pickleweeds, which was um, an interesting uh, observation. Um, a little background on iNaturalist, it's a useful app where it, it helps you identify um, what kinds of birds um, you'll see when you walk around. Um, it doesn't only identify birds, but also plants, insects. Um, and so we participate, and by using iNaturalist, we participated um, in this project called Snapshot California Coast 2021 um, that is tracking biodiversity and how species are affected by climate change over time. Um, here you can see a picture uh, we took and uploaded on iNaturalist. And here are some more observations we saw. Anyway, thank you guys for listening to our presentation. Um, here's a photo of us externs um, doing a cleanup at the lake actually yesterday, um, which you would have seen in David's video. And if you're interested oh, with the Lake Merritt Institute, and if you're interested in learning more about the lake, please come to the future Lakeside Chats or go to the RNNCF website and see how you can get involved with the wonderful work that they do here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Externs. Um, you were wonderful to work with and I um, really enjoyed them. Um, so at this point, um, we're going to, um, and, and we'll, um, at this point, we're going to introduce our, our speaker, our featured speaker uh, for today, Damon Tai, um, well known to many of you. Um, Damon, um, I've known Damon probably for over 10 years in, um, as a former teacher in Oakland. Um, Damon was born in Klamath Falls, Oregon, a uh, condition that he shares with Hank, the uh, rescue pelican. And he was raised in Califor Calaveras County in California. Damon attended St. Mary's College, and he worked on local newspapers and while earning a biology chemistry degree. He taught high school in Portland, Oregon, and then he had, uh, at all while this is happening, he's uh, become a, a master photographer and still has a great interest in photography. Um, he, after he left his uh, job in um, Portland to uh, work with the Human Genome Project. Uh, at the National uh, Labs Joint Genome um, Institute. And uh, he brings a, a really deep knowledge of um, biotechnology and DNA science. Um, he also has developed skills in filmmaking and art. Um, and he, uh, so he currently manages a uh, apartment complex in Oakland and works for BioRad Laboratories designing a curriculum and training educators um, about uh, DNA science and also natural history. Um, Damon has joined iNaturalist in 2011. And at, to date he has um, made 58,245 observations um, of 10,236 species. So um, this is fantastic Damon. <laughs> um, and um, we really would like to also um, mention he has an infectious interest that in natural history, um, in teaching, enjoying nature, and always generous with his time. And um, we're so lucky to have you tonight, Dana. So are, are you ready to, to launch? Thank I'm ready you. to launch. Okay. All right, welcome everybody. I'm going to give you a presentation on the mushrooms of Lake Merritt tonight. So a little bit of it's gonna be kind of upfront. Some of the stuff that was in the quizzes actually from Katie, uh, a little bit about the biology of fungi and then specifically kind of the branch that we think about that has mushrooms associated with them. We'll talk a little bit about iNaturalist just so that you guys understand how that platform works since that's what I primarily use as my digital notebook of everything I've seen in the last 10 years when it comes to organisms. And then we'll do the species tour or an abbreviated species tour of mushrooms from Lake Merritt because there are way too many to cover in a small like hour long period. Um, but there's some very notable ones uh, there within those ones. In the chat right now, what I'm gonna drop is uh, the PowerPoint I'm using tonight. So if you ever wanna go back and reference it, you'll have access to it. You can flip right through it and find those slides again. If there is something you're like, oh, I wanna see that again, you'll have access to it. 
Also, if you've got questions as I'm going through the presentation, if you drop those in the chat, we will grab those and then get to all of them at the end. Um, and then if you ever want to just kind of have a continual stream of mushrooms from Oakland in your life, um, there's my iNaturalist and Instagram handle. With that, let me share my screen and we will jump into my slide deck. Let me arrange this screen really quickly and go into present mode. All right, Katie, quick head shake. Can you see the slides? Um, yes, they look great. All right. So I usually give this talk for about an hour. I might kind of speed it up just to, to be um, aware of people's time tonight. Um, but this is generally it. We'll go through kind of mushroom and fungi basics, making observations. Wait, 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 wait. Damon, this is David. And uh, I just want to, uh, I understand what you just said and I appreciate it. Um, I'm a little concerned. I mean, some of us are coming to this rather new and you're so fascinating. Uh, I want to ask you to see if we could uh, maybe not get as much, but take a uh, a slower a slower time with it. I don't want you to, if you can, uh, just pace yourself for us. I'll, and, uh, I'll, I'll pace and, myself. I'll pace myself. And what I'll do is if I feel that we're getting a little bit long, which I can easily do on fungi, what I will do is I will just kind of trim out some of the ones that aren't as exciting to most lay people. And that'll be the best way to manage time for this evening, I believe. Uh, okay, that'll be, uh, yeah, that'll be great. You know, I just come here, I just left my, butter, my buddy, his name is uh, Jerry Fungus. And uh, I had to console him because he just rented an apartment, but he told me it wasn't much room. Wait oh. for that. <laughs> okay, go ahead, uh, right. Damon. So, so that's the general scheme of, of what we're, where we're going today. Um, and to start us off, we're gonna start with a little bit of basic biology because it's good to understand where fungi fit into the big picture. So if we're looking at fungi kind of on the general tree of life, here's the tree of life. And if you look at it really quickly, what you realize that the big stuff, the eukaryotes, those things with like multi-cells is a very, very small branch of the tree of life. The majority of it is all these microbes that we can't see, which means in the big scheme, we know nothing about biology on this planet, or we know we know a lot as far as big stuff goes, but we're still figuring out all the minutia. And that is something that's gonna happen over, I would say, our externs um, lifetime, is they're gonna be the generation that explores the microcosmos, and we really get a handle on the diversity of life on this planet. So fungi, where do they fall on this tree? Well, they are a really interesting one because some of them fall kind of more in that kind of microbial world, i.e. in that we, can't see it with our naked eyes all the time, but a portion of them also exists at this macro level where we can see them. Those tend to be ones that produce fruiting bodies that we call fungi. They, on the tree of life, sit much closer to us than they do to plants, even though historically, like all the way up until 1969, fungi and plants were in the same category. And that was because if you're looking at just kind of attributes, right, they don't get up and walk around. You don't see them like hunting down things and eating them. Um, and so people were like, Looks like a plant to me, you know, stays in one place, sessile. But then after some work, you know, digging in, like really looking how they feed. And then especially once molecular data hit, it was very obvious that, you know what? These organisms are much like, more like us, like the animals than they are like the plants. So just that's where they sit in the grand scream, scream the grand scheme of things. Um, if we jump into that little kind of piece that is the, the fungal portion of the tree of life, there is a lot of diversity there. But the majority of it we can't see without a microscope. So I'm not gonna take you guys very down the you know, lens of my microscope tonight. So that way, the things you get to hear about and see are all things that you could walk around Lake Merritt and find on your own. So we're gonna talk about things that produce mushrooms. Mushrooms are just the fruiting bodies of specific branches of the fungal kingdom. Predominantly, there's two kind of taxonomic groups that produce fungi, the basidiomycetes, and this is by far the dominant group that produce large fruiting bodies that we can see. So this is, when you see like the button mushroom in the store, that is your classic basidiomycete. It's got gills on it, it produces these basidium cells that then will have four spores usually on them. But then there's another group, the ascomycetes, known as the cup fungi, um, and these guys, some of them get big enough that you can see. In fact, some of them we're really familiar with because as humans, we like to eat them. Morels are a good example of this. They were a cup fungi that just kind of folds up on itself really funny to form this big structure. 
there are ones that do just form these little perfect colorful cups that are all around Lake Mary in the winter time. So we'll look at you know a couple of those um, while we're doing this tour. As we go down further on those ones, those ones that start to get more in the micro level, you guys are familiar with a couple of those because they they'll show up as being molds on your bread or you know weird things growing in wet places in your house, things like that. But for the most part, we're not going to cover those today because we're just going to cover the big ones that you could accidentally hit with your foot and see around Lake Merritt. So Basidiomyces, there is a huge diversity in what the fruiting body of a Basidiomyces could look like. And so this is a general simple key that is on microweb.com CAF, Cal the California version of it. And this is, if you're just starting to want to learn about mushrooms, this is a fantastic source um, in California if you're just looking for a free digital place to go. So they have a simple key. You can kind of see the different shapes of the Basidiomyces come in and get a feel for them. So the agaricus fungi are the ones that produce the gills, like the agaricus button mushroom that you would buy at the store. The boletes are another group that are prized um, and people like to eat. They, instead of having gills um, where the basidia are and where the spores are gonna come out of, they'll form these kind of, I call it sponge pads. They look like a giant sponge on the bottom. They got all these little pores. Um, and then we have chanterelles, also a well-known edible. These have what we call primitive gills. So instead of having these paper thin gills, they'll have these little wrinkly lines more or less on their outside. We get ones that form little clubs. They look like little thumbs sticking up out of the ground. We have teeth fungi. So instead of having gills or pores, they have these little tiny like teeth sticking out all over them. And all around those teeth is where the spores are coming out. Polypores are these ones that form giant like shelves, usually on wood, and they'll have really, really small pores. We have a number of those around Lake Merritt. Jelly fungi are exactly what they sound like. They feel and look just like jelly. You can push them and they'll kind of wobble like some jello. Um, we definitely have those around Lake Merritt. We have earth stars, which are these ones that will emerge from the ground and they look like a little star with a giant ball sticking on the top of it. And that ball is filled with spores that can be dispersed. We also have bird's nest fungi around Lake Merritt. These are like little tiny cups and they look like they have little tiny eggs inside of them. Each of those eggs is covered more or less in spore material. And then one of the classics around Lake Merritt, that you'll get some good photographs at the end, are the stink horns. These are fungi that emerge from a little egg and they have a very unique style in getting their spores dispersed, i.e. instead of appealing to a mammal to come eat them or maybe a fly to come, you know, or, you know, a fungus gnat to come get spores on them, they appeal to the organisms that like to eat dead stuff. So carrion flies and things like that are attracted to them because they usually smell like a dead organism. And then we have some truffle-like fungi also around Lake Merritt in the Basidios. The ascomycetes, for the most part, are these cup fungi that we'll see around Lake Merritt. Some of them can come in different shapes, though, besides a cup. Some of them they will call earth tongues. They also look like a little club sticking up out of the ground. You could see morels around Lake Merritt. I've seen a couple of them. We, you, there is the possibility of finding true truffles around Lake Merritt based upon some of our trees. I've yet to find them, though. Um, but there's a number of other kind of ascomycetes around Lake Merritt that we'll get full photographs of later. The big thing to understand though, I think just for getting a grip on the mushroom forming fungi is their life cycle. Because when you talk to people about fungi and mushrooms they are like, well, which, which is which? And you're like, well, they're actually the same. Well, actually mushrooms are just one little piece of the fungal life cycle. So if we take a very generic agaricus mushroom, i.e. one with gills here, um, this is more or less what the life cycle looks like. You've got the fruiting body, so this is the fruiting body you could say is analogous to an apple on an apple tree. The mushroom is analogous to that apple. It's got little seeds in it. We call them spores. They're coming off those basidia um, cells that are on the gills. The spores will get dispersed either through the wind or through a, an organismal vector. They'll float around, they'll find a place to land. And if they get some place that they like, they'll germinate. Each one of those spores will start to send out little threads of single cells all lined up after, after each other that we call hyphae. Hyphae then can find each other, because at this point we've just got one copy of the genome in each one of these. But if hyphae finds one um, that's of a different mating type, um, they will basically lock onto each other, trade um, nuclei, and become this giant thing we call mycelium, which is more or less thicker looking threads of stuff that looks kind of like hyphae, but it's really, really thick, white, and, and fuzzy. So if you've ever flipped over a log or like a rotten piece of wood someplace, and you find this like 
fluffy white stuff. A lot of people sometimes will think that it's a spider web to start with, but if you look closer, it's kind of it's really tough. That's, that's mycelium. That's, that's the mushroom most of its lifetime. Most of its lifetime is that. And then what it will do is as it's eating its food and the way mushrooms eat or fungi eat is they barf out enzymes into the environment around them, which then allows them to digest food around them and then they suck in just the parts that they want to eat. So instead of doing internal digestion like we do, they do more or less external digestion and then just pick up some of these sugar components that they're gonna use inside their cells. So they'll do that most of the year. And then as the season for them to kind of bloom and put up their fruiting body is coming, they'll start to form what we call hyphal knot, i.e. that mycelium will start kind of clustering together and getting really nice and tight. And then what it's doing is it's waiting for just the right environmental changes, i.e. it's getting the right humidity and the right temperature. And that hyphal knot will turn into a little primordia. And that primordia, and this happens a lot of times right after the rains, it will just erupt up and boom. All of a sudden, you've got mushrooms all over the place. Um, and it's really amazing because they're able to focus all this energy from all that mycelium into a fruiting body extremely quickly in some cases. Some of these large mushrooms can pop up within two days after a rain, and all of a sudden you've got this you know, one pound of organism that just showed up out of the ground and is there ready to spread its spores. So that is the general life cycle of fungi. If we were to look at different mushrooms um, in the Basidiomyces, especially the agaricus mushrooms, there are different attributes that are used to key them out to figure out who am I here? And a lot of this comes down to the shape of the cap and the way that the gills are attached to the stem and if you're a mycologist, for whatever reason, we like to call stems stipes. And so you could have different types of gill attachment to the stipe. You could have it not attached, which we would call um, notched or free. Uh, you could have ones that then run down the stem, which is known as the current. But noting that type of attachment will definitely help you figure out which mushroom or which genera you are looking at. Um, another thing that can be very helpful in identifying mushrooms is doing a spore print. Spore prints are actually a little bit of magic, it feels like, because you're taking something like a mushroom and you're going to actually be able to see all these microscopic things you can't see with your eyes by more or less just cutting off some of the mushroom cap, placing it on a surface. I like to use a little Petri dish, but you could just do it on a piece of paper and let it sit there overnight. If you can cover it with a bowl so that way wind's not blowing spores around, it's even better. And what'll happen is overnight, it will be dropping spores that entire time and there'll be so many of them that they pile up. So when you remove the cap the next day, boom, you got this pile of spores that looks like an imprint of the gills. And the color on that can be very helpful for figuring out which genera these belong to. And it runs the whole gamut of colors white to black to orange to green to yellow and everything in between. And I, I guess I haven't seen a blue one though or a purple one, but if you see one, let me know. That would be really cool to see. And just like most of science, there's a lot of stuff we've observed that we still don't understand. We still don't have a good scientific study of why fungi have different spore color types. There's hypotheses, one of them very strong one I think being, that a lot of the fungi that happen to fruit like out in the open, like in a grassy lawn, they tend to have dark spores. Uh, these dark spores have melanin in them, which is a component that could protect you from UV sunlight, maybe protect your DNA inside your spore. Um, but at the same time, you can find some of these in the grass that are producing white spores. So it doesn't quite fit, but this would be a really cool question for somebody to figure out how to test and how to get us an answer about what's going on here at the biological level. Um, another thing you could do if you're really getting nerdy about mushrooms, you could get yourself a microscope and you could start looking at the basidium, the spores, or in the ascomycetes, the ascus and their spores. So the crazy thing about those ascomycetes is they have this long tube cell, that's what we call the ascus, it actually means kind of like a wine sack. Um, it'll usually have eight cells inside of it, so it goes through meiosis and then goes through mitosis to get you eight total spores with just one copy of the genome in each. Um, I guess it's a way just to get yourself more spores. But the cool thing about them is most of these, what'll happen is as it matures, the tip of that ascus gets, I don't know, flexible, brittle, ready to burst. And with the right sort of like air pressure change or even humidity, 
the top of it will basically crack open and there's pressure built up inside of that little ASCA cell and it will just shoot out. And so that's why some of these cup fungi, if you blow on them and then you stand back, you'll see them smoke. And what that smoking is, it's all those ASCII blowing their tops and shooting their spores out into the wind column, which is really, really cool. If you then decide that that level of nerd just wasn't enough for you, we can get you in to do barcode the lake stuff and we can do some DNA sequencing on these fungi. And this is a really big thing for fungi in the Western portion of the United States. That's because a lot of fire fungi got the wrong, had the wrong names on them. Um, we gave them names, my call just gave them names that match stuff in Europe that kind of look the same, the mushroom kind of looked the same. But usually once you start doing microscopy, you go, eh, maybe we don't have the same thing here. And then once you do some DNA sequencing and the sequences don't match, you, you can say pretty definitely, yeah, we've got something new here. We need to change the name on it. So in my college in the West Coast, names have just been changing like crazy the last like 10, 15 years as molecular work becomes more and more available to more people. But it's amazing because it's allowing kind of community citizen scientists to have a huge footprint in our understanding of this taxonomy. In fact, we've had a couple of little mini breakthroughs at Lake Merritt since we started our sequencing program. And I'll talk about those uh, a little bit later. If you want a good guide for California and for Lake Merritt, these are my three major recommendations. Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast is the most beautiful mushroom book I've ever seen. And it just laid out really easily. It is my favorite go-to um, for our region. It's also kind of interesting because it was made by two non-academics, two people that are community scientists, Noah Siegel and Christian Schwartz um, put this book together. Um, California Mushrooms uh, by Dennis, uh, Michael Wood and Frederick Stevens comes out of more of an academic background and it actually covers all of the regions of California, not just the coastal ones. And so these are great, great two books to have. But then there's also this one that maybe if you're just like starting to get into mushrooms, this is maybe where you really, really should start. And this is David Aurora's classic book, All the Rain and More. And that cover might creep you out. It did for me for many years. In fact, I didn't buy it because I thought I couldn't take it seriously. And then I eventually bought it and was like, no, I should have bought that years ago. It is one of the best starter field guides I've ever come across. And that's because it combines everything you want to know about mushrooms. Is it dangerous? How do I test what it is? Is it edible? And it is full of vignettes that are super jokey, fun. I mean, it's actually one of the field guides. If you pick it up, you'll read it all the way through because it's actually fun to read, which you can't say about many field guides, right? They're kind of references. So that's my pitch for it. David's classic, All the Rain Promises and More. However, though, the other learning tool that you should have in your back pocket, because you probably already have it in your back pocket, is a cell phone with the iNaturalist app downloaded. iNaturalist is a platform that was built by um, a handful of folks back kind of like a 2010 area. Kenichi Oida, actually who lives in Oakland, was one of the guys that helped build this. Um, and it allows you to basically take a picture of any organism, anything, anything that's alive. And you can be, you can be the jerk on the platform like me that puts bacteria on there. It's like, can somebody identify for this for me? Like literally anything that's alive. You can take pictures of it, upload it to a global database, and there's guys like me and girls like me or people out there identifying stuff every day on there. And they'll help you figure out what species you have. And in the last couple of years, they trained an artificial intelligence on this platform. And the AI is actually getting very, very good, like scarily good uh, at being able to get you usually down to at least the genus level call on a lot of things. And so this is what I do every time I find a mushroom. In fact, this is what I find anytime I find anything cool around anywhere. I take a picture of it, upload it to iNaturalist because it allows me to a, keep a little notebook of everything I've seen. And because I put my um, GPS location on there and a temporal stamp, I know when and where I saw it, which is really cool because an ecologist can mine this data. And he, this is basically building the largest species biogeography map on the planet. And it's a crazy. In the 10 years INAT's been around, they've rebuilt species biogeography maps. It took humans like you know, 500 to 1,000 years to build. And just, boom, you have them again in 10 years, which is really important because change takes place. This is allowing us to see these species biogeographies move. In fact, let me highlight why I got addicted to this. I was on the PCT. Remember, I'm a molecular biologist. I don't know much about big biology. I took a picture of a really big spider. 
up by Castle Crags. And I was like, put it on there. I was like, tarantula. Somebody came on. I was like, no, it's not a tarantula. It's a false tarantula. I was like, oh, it's kind of close. Well, no, it's, it's really not closely related. Okay. He's like, are you sure you've got the right GPS location on this? Like, yeah, I am. This is like a section of PCT I've always wanted to do. He's like, it's 250 miles out of range. What? And so a group has gone back up, found a population there. And now in iNaturalist, you can see other populations people have found that come back down to the known biogeography of this, which is basically the San Francisco Bay Area. So we're seeing a northward migration of this organism due to climate change. And there are many, many stories like this with INAT data now. Also, INAT has been helpful in rediscovering species we thought were extinct and actually finding new species. So totally a great reason to be on there. If you're going to use iNaturals for mushrooms, let's talk about what you got to get in your shots. So you guys already know a little bit about the things that people use to identify mushrooms. So get those in your photograph. Get a full picture of that fruiting body. Get a picture of the gill attachment. Get a picture of the top of the cap and get a picture of the stipe, the end of the base of that mushroom. Or you could be a super photography pro and you know arrange your mushrooms and just get all of them in one photograph. Sometimes I do this, but a lot of times I just take all four pictures and upload them. I also would like to get one photograph of the habitat they're in because as Katie brought up earlier, some fungi, right? Actually a good number of fungi, are mycel. So being able to see the habitat and understanding what trees are close or whether plants are close is very helpful in identification. Um, once all those are up there, other people then can go on iNaturals and quickly figure out what you've got. Especially in California, there's a really robust community around identifying them. In fact, there's a mycologist by the name of Alan Rockefeller who will pretty much identify most things end up on iNet for a fungi every night if he's got internet access, which is just mind blowing the dedication or people on iNaturalist trying to help you identify stuff. Um, tricks that you should be aware of for your cell phone just for iNaturalist. If you're taking a picture of a really light colored mushroom in a really dark area, you need to know that, that when you're, if you hold down your screen, it can lock the autofocus. And if you then swipe your finger up and down, you can change the exposure. So that way you can actually get the details on your mushroom and not just have this blown out chanterelle that nobody will be able to identify. The other big thing is majority of biological life on this planet, right, is small. We already talked about that in the tree of life. Most of like the stuff I'm interested in with fungi is like right at our level, but most of it's actually a lot lower. And so I need something to get me close. And so there are these really cheap clip-on lenses that just go over the top of your cell phone. They just go right over it like this. All of a sudden, I have a dissecting scope in the field for five bucks. So you see that little mushroom on the left there? And that ring thing in the center, that's the ring I wear on my finger all the time as a measurement. That is 2.5 centimeters across. That little tiny mushroom there, that photograph was just taken with this super cheap instrument. You all of a sudden will realize there are just bazillion organisms around you all the time that you've been missing as soon as you have one of these. You should really go out one and use this with your new iNaturalist addiction. Um, I won't take you through how to upload stuff to iNat because it's currently changing. So just know that you can go there and find stuff. You can also mine data out of there, which is something to be aware of. So I could open up iNaturalist on the browser or on my phone and actually just go and look to see what things are happening someplace. And so I could go to say Diamond Park and the canyon there and see what fungi are coming up, what, what people have been seeing, which then for me might be an impetus for me to go there. Oh, stuff's coming up that I wanted to see. I'll go for a walk there today. So it's a really kind of cool way that you can mine uh, what is going on in the world around you. All right, that being said, Here's the browser view of iNaturalist for Lake Merritt for just fungi. Fungi, of course, in this case, are going to include mushrooms and lichens, but you know what? There's not a ton of people identifying lichens or taking pictures of lichens around Lake Merritt. So if you really want to contribute, do some of that. Uh, the majority of them right now are fungi. The amazing thing is Lake Merritt, right, as a city park, basically the gem of Oakland, has very little terrestrial land, right? Most of the park is water, but we have over 150 species of fungi, mushrooms that you can find there within a given year. So let me give you a tour of some of the exciting ones. All right, the first one, and this is just because this one you can find pretty much all year round. You find some wet landscaping wood chips around Lake Merritt and just start going there and visiting it once a month you will probably find this mushroom. This is known as the lattice stinkhorn. The scientific name is Clathrus ruber, and this is part of the stinkhorn family. And these are wild because they attract carrion flies to 
basically move their spores around. So they make this super cool geodesic dome. It literally, when you find it, you're like, I just found an alien. Hey, everybody, alien, 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 come over here. And if you get up and you smell it, you'll be like, oh, that was a bad idea. It smells just like the corpse flower that some of you guys saw a couple weeks ago around Lake Merritt. It produces a lot of the same compounds in order to attract these flies. The flies come in thinking they've just found the dead body because A, color's right, smell is right. They start marching around, they go inside that geodesic dome and you see that kind of gray, sticky, browny stuff inside? That's the spores. Those will stick to the flies. Flies don't find the food, they fly off with those spores and now those spores find their way to another place for this to live. Um, when these guys are really young, if you cut them open, they look like little eyeballs. In fact, some cultures will eat these at that stage before they start emerging. Um, I still haven't quite brought myself to eat these ones yet. It will be on my to-do list for the next couple of years. Um, but super, super cool one to find. The next one we have around Lake Merritt um, that is very notable, i.e. it does things that people wouldn't imagine for kind of temperate California is we have bioluminescent mushrooms, ones that glow in the dark. So the common name for this is the Western jack-o'-lantern because it glows at night like a jack-o'-lantern. Um, it produces this kind of green glow though, not a candlelight glow. Um, these are usually found at Lake Merritt on our oak trees. And if you find them at the base of the oak tree, it means that oak tree is not doing so good. This is a saprophytic fungi, i.e. it eats dead stuff, which means it's usually eating dead roots or a dead tree trunk. Um, the way to identify these is they've got this kind of orangish, brownish top. They've got gills that are very decurrent. They'll run all the way down and they'll be associating right next to an oak tree. These are also a coveted dye mushroom, i.e. if you take this, you grind it up, you can use it to dye wool purple colors. And if you change your mordant, you can get some green colors from them. Um, the only kind of bad thing about these is people that are just starting in mushroom culture and are really focused on like, man, I would just wanna find mushrooms and put them in my mouth and eat them. This is one of the ones they accidentally put in their mouth and eat thinking it's a chanterelle. And this um, is not a chanterelle and it'll make you never want to ingest a mushroom again because you'll have things coming out from every orifice. So not one that belongs in the body. Um, let's talk about the one that everybody needs to know about because everybody's, when you talk, tell people like, oh, I'm into mushrooms. They're like, that sounds really dangerous. You know what? Mushrooms are not dangerous compared to plants in California. A handful of mushrooms that are deadly toxic relatively easy to identify where the number of plants that will put you in bad shape if you were to put them in your body, I can't even get a full list of, um, let alone plants of all sorts of dermatitis issues, things like that. There's no fungi in California that'll ever cause you a dermatitis issue. You could pick up any mushroom you like, handle it, play with it, no danger. The only danger is if you're ingesting them. So Amanita phylloides, i.e. the death cap, is the most dangerous mushroom in California, and it's not even ours. It's Europe's. So this is an invasive species we picked up from Europe due to nursery stock. We think it probably came in on cork oak, Quercus suber, which is pretty closely related to our California live oak, Quercus agrifolia, which means they're closely related enough fungi that are mycorrhizal with one can jump to the other. And that's exactly what we've seen with Amanita phylloides. How you identify an Amanita mushroom is that they tend to have white gills, and they also emerge usually from a little egg in the ground. And so we call that a vulva. The way you identify Amanita phylloides is that you will usually find it associ associating with coast live oak. It will have those white gills. When young, it will have an, a big skirt, like an annulus, these, uh, that thing hanging down from underneath the cap. And those were, those were fibers that were covering the gills originally. And it will have what we call a flaring vulva. It'll have that cup that it's kind of emerging from and it'll kind of stick up really, really high. It tends to also have a kind of a metallic -y green sheen to the cap. Um, and so that is the way to identify this mushroom. You can touch it, you can handle it, you can smell it. You're not gonna be in trouble. You're only in trouble if this goes into your mouth and goes into your GI tract because what's going into your GI tract is a handful of different toxins. There's a series of phallotoxins that I won't get into. 
the one that's of most concern in this mushroom is the alpha amanitin toxin. What this does is, is it shuts down your cell's ability to make proteins. So it shuts down RNA polymerase two, which means DNA, the thing that holds all the information for your cells about what to do and how to do things, it needs to turn that information into proteins, the things that actually do stuff in your cells and give you tissue and all that stuff. It comes in there and disrupts that, which means all of a sudden everything goes to hell. Things stop working. There is now a protocol to deal with people that have accidentally ingested this that was developed at Santa Cruz, um, but you definitely wanna, don't want to end up um, on that track. Um, death is usually very painful. It takes multiple days to die. And the sad thing is this isn't a mushroom that when you eat it, you go, oh, whoa, that was horrible. That must not be good for me. It actually tastes pretty good um, according to all the people that have survived. And then symptoms don't really set in sometimes till 24 hours later, which means it's a little bit too late to pump the stomach. Um, and so the protocol that's used to help people through this is based upon um, seeds, um, a component called sibilin that comes out of there, which will constrict the sphincter on your gallbladder. The gallbladder is where the toxin is cycling back and forth. They can drain your gallbladder or pull your gallbladder and then do other kind of procedures to help you get through it. But usually it's liver damage and kidney damage is what kills people. We do have other amanitas at Lake Merritt, which from a um, historical point of view, different cultures have very different orientations towards this specific mushroom. And this is probably the most easily to see mushroom on the planet when it comes to or identify species on the planet for people, right? It's the Super Mario Brother mushroom if you grew up in my era, or the Flyagyric mushroom. It is the Amanita muscaria. Bright red cap, white spots on it. It is an amanita mushroom. It'll have those white gills and it will have a, a pretty big annulus on it. It's coming up out of a, a little egg shape when it's young. Um, this produces compounds that are very, very rough on mammals like us. It produces ibotenic acid and muscimol. One of those makes you feel really, really sick. And the other one is basically a dissociative high sort of thing. Um, not good from anybody I've ever talked to about this, but some cultures eat this mushroom by detoxifying it, i.e. you take this mushroom, you parboil it three times, you boil it in water, toss that water out, boil it in water, toss it out, do it one more time, and you're able to remove those components and then eat it. I do this. Um, some people like David Aurora tell people like, this is the first mushroom you should learn to eat because it's so easy to identify, but there's tons of argument within the mycological community about whether or not that's good or advice or not. What I say is, it is one of the most beautiful mushrooms you'll ever see. You should just enjoy it for what it looks like. It is very, very striking. We get these around Lake Merritt, around our conifers during really wet seasons. So that means I haven't seen them in the last two years because we are super in a drought. But once we get a good storm again and a couple, you know, maybe a couple good storms, you'll start to see these pop up around the Atlas Cedars and things like that around Lake Merritt. Um, one of the ones you're, I've been seeing a lot around Lake Merritt the last couple of years, and this might be related to drought, is the honey mushroom. This is a mushroom that is parasitic, i.e. it kills trees. Um, and it's well known as being the Guinness Book of World Records largest organism on the planet. If you go to Eastern Oregon, this thing is like taking up like a circle that's five, di five kilometers in diameter, and it's all the same organism. So what you're seeing is actually the mycelial mat of that thing just killing all those Doug fir trees in Oregon. Um, same thing with it here. It kills trees um, around, mainly around the garden from what I've seen. And you'll see these huge clusters of them kind of pop up. They'll be there for a couple years until the tree goes down. And then they'll fruit a couple more years as they're taking down the rest of the rootstock. And then that's it. They'll pass, they'll pass on. Um, I'll usually see these come up for kind of four to five consecutive years at the lake. This is an edible mushroom. Um, people do like to eat this one. It's called a honey mushroom because of the flavor of it. Um, the stalks on them are really thick. If you open them up, they have a pith inside. If you peel that pith out and kind of fry that, it is a very sweet tasting mushroom. And the caps, a lot of times people will use to make uh, spaghetti sauce with. The caution though about eating anything from an urban environment though is fungi are very good at scavenging things, right? The mycorrhizal ones are doing this for their hosts, like picking up, you know, certain metals and things like that that they need and handing it off to the host and other micronutrients. So they can accumulate stuff that you don't want to eat, i.e., you know, weird chemicals that people have used in the past, heavy metals and stuff like that. So it's actually not a good idea to consume a lot of mushrooms from urban environments 
um, unless you've done a lot of testing on them. Um, this mushroom, the easiest way to identify it, large clusters, usually near a tree that's not doing well, it will have these kind of whitish cream colored gills um, and those stalks, when you open them up, they'll just be full of this really nice kind of pith that just kind of pours out. And if they're older, they'll just have a dusting of white spore prints all over the place, or white spores all over the caps beneath them. The most ubiquitous mushroom seen by every jogger at Lake Merritt, Agaricus xanthodermis. This one looks just like the button mushroom that people buy at the store, but this is definitely not one that most people will want to ingest because it is part of what we call the lose your lunch bunch of the agaricus. This one will give you severe GI upset. It is really easy to identify this one though, because if you basically genie in the bottle, the top of a baby one, it will stain bright yellow as it oxidizes. And if you smell it, it has this very strong chemical smell. In the mycology community, people will refer to this as a phenolic scent. It smells like the cleaning solutions that you would see in your dentist office or in your doctor's office. Um, these will have big fruiting events in the grass areas of Lake Merritt, usually starting right at the end of summer and transitioning through about November. So September to November is the high point for these. Um, and they will also have these really kind of thick, felty annuluses. So that little skirt on it will be nice and thick on, on this agaricus. Agaricus bernardii is another agaricus mushroom that we can find at Lake Merritt. It was the salt agaricus. And it's called the salt agaricus because if you cut it and you smell it, it has this briny smell to it. And actually, if you cook with it, you don't need to add salt to it really. It already has this very salty-like flavor to it. These will be a very, very large agaricus mushroom. Um, I particularly like this agaricus, so I've been um, instrumental at making sure we haven't lost any of the patches of this over the years as development has gone on through um, updating how Lake Merritt has looked. So now there's probably at least seven patches of these um, across Lake Merritt that I, I maintain by picking adult ones, ones that the gills have started to turn chocolate colored from pink, and basically putting them in new locations that I think they would like. Um, another one, way to identify this one is when you cut it, besides that briny smell, it will oxidize pink. Um, so it has this kind of slow staining reaction. A very, very, very coveted agaricus mushroom that occurs at Lake Merritt. In fact, so much so I have a hard time finding it because mycologists um, throughout the East Bay will come to hunt this one in Lake Merritt is the Prince mushroom, Agaricus augustus. It has this royal name due to the scales on its cap look like, you know, like someone's long flowing robe of a prince. It also has this fantastic smell to it. It smells kind of like almond extract and it has those sweet almondy extract flavors when you cook it. These can get to be dinner plate sized at Lake Merritt. Um, they usually will occur in places where there's been a lot of debris accumulating, especially leaves and sticks. Um, and these also occur during the fall season predominantly. So I'll see these kind of early, early in the fall when we're still getting warm periods. And then I'll see them again in the spring with the first kind of warming of the spring and we're still over watering the lawns. That's exactly when these like to fruit. On the lawns, we'll find Leuco agaricus leucothyces, the white dapperling. This one, when you first see it, even when I first saw it, I was like, whoa. That looks scary. Looks kind of like an Amanita. It's all white. I've got white gills, but it never has that kind of vulva that it emerges from. It does have a swollen base on it though. Um, this one will give you kind of a creamy colored spore print. It is edible, but it is definitely not one that I encourage anybody to go after just because of the potential confusion with Amanitas. It's closely related, um, you know, cousin species, Leucogaricus barcii, the white shaggy dapperling, it's got a fluffy top instead of that smooth top, is one I actually do enjoy eating now that I've figured out how to identify it against everything else. This one also gregariously fruits in the fall um, around Lake Merritt in the grass. And this is one that you'll see all over the Bay Area come early fall. A very impressive mushroom that you can find at Lake Merritt. And I'm always not just impressed by the size, but where I will find this is the shaggy parasol. The name shaggy parasol in California can actually refer to three different species. And so that's why when you become more interested in fungi, you really want to learn the Latin names 
because that allows you to speak with more precision about the organism that you're looking at. So chlorophyllum bruneum is the shaggy parasol that we most commonly see at Lake Merritt. It has these kind of large clustered fibers on top of its cap. It's got a very white stem on it that will oxidize brown in time. And then it has a, what we call an abrupt bulb. So if you're going down on the stem, it will almost go 90 degrees all of a sudden and make this bulb at the base. This thing loves to grow wherever people put woody leafy debris. In fact, I just found this last week by my side of the lake, which I never see it at. And it's because somebody just piled up a bunch of eucalyptus junk against the eucalyptus. And there was a giant one of these, the size of my head there. Um, and so you can find these all over Lake Merritt. Just look for where the landscaping crew has been like dumping leaves and grass and you will find this. This is an edible mushroom, but some people do have um, an allergy to it. And so it's one, if you are gonna get into finding this one and eating it, you want to test just a little tiny bit of it, sleep on it, see how you feel. And then you could go further uh, later with it. It has a very strong umami flavor to it. I actually like to dry these and turn them into a powder that I then use uh, to sauce things later with. Candle, uh, Candelomyces candelina, which was formerly known as Satharella, the genus name, this just got changed in the last year. And this is the problem about, not problem, but the curious thing about mycology right now is these names are just constantly changing. So you're like, I know that is this. Oh no, I have to change what I know now. It's now this. Um, this one loves our grassy lawns. Um, it loves being next to where we've got dead or dying trees in the grass or wood chips that have made their way into the grass. And so actually just this week, there was one of the largest broodings of these I've ever seen at Snow Park. I could have easily picked probably 200 of these at once. They're a really kind of attractive mushroom, but they're very, very brittle. So when you pick them up, you kind of squeeze them. They almost will just snap in your hands. Um, they are edible, but nobody eats them just because the texture is weird and you rarely find huge 200 cat fl flushes like I found this past week. The way that you can easily identify them though is that they've got this kind of beige cream cap on them. The gills will get smoky colored in age. So they'll start off white and they'll get this kind of smoky gray in age. And then of course, if you touch them, they break apart very easily. Um, especially when a tree is removed at Lake Merritt, if you go to where that tree was removed, these will be the first thing that flushes the next year in horrendous numbers. Um, other grass ones that we can find, and these are kind of the small ones that some people aren't interested in, but I love seeing them because it tells me about how small environmental changes have happened over the last couple of days. Because you get, remember, you got to need the right humidity and temperature to get things to trigger to fruit. And so these are the ones that tell me something's changed. Like we had a really cold fog event, or it was a really wet fog, and all of a sudden these are going up. So Boblitis uh, titubens, the yellow field cap is very, very ubiquitous um, in our grasslands at Lake Merritt, especially whenever we put in new sod. These are in really, really big numbers the following year. And then they'll kind of hit a plateau and they kind of stay at that for a number of years. The cool thing about these ones is they come up really quick and they go away really quick. So these will be up and gone usually within three days. They start out really or kind of this you know, yellow color, then they'll fade to a kind of a white, and then they'll, as they dry, they become yellow again. But then the crazy thing is, if you look at the gills on them, the gills look white. But if you spore print them, you get this bright, rusty color. And it's just like, whoa, where did that come from? You don't see that on, you can't see the spore color on the gills. So it's a really cool one from that point of view. Another one that happens in the same environment as these, easy to confuse with them, is the milky cap, Conocide alpala. The way you differentiate these ones is this one looks more like a dunce's cap when it comes up and it's also a lot thinner and it will dry up. We have a wind right after they've popped up. They just, they dry out within one day and kind of shrivel over. Uh, get the same rusty spore print from them. This was an interesting species because for, there was a lot of time that was debated whether or not these were toxic or not, if they had phallotoxins in them. And you know what? It doesn't matter because you could never collect enough of these to ever get yourself in trouble with any of the toxins that were in them because they are so infinitely small. Their biomass is super, super tiny. But these are going up like crazy right now because we just had that fog event and then it got a little bit warm. Um, so these are up all over Lake Merritt right now. This is just starting to push up at Lake Merritt right now. This is what's known as mower's mushroom. And that's because lawnmowers are probably what distribute this thing all over the place. And it loves growing in the mulchy grass clippings that lawnmowers make. 
Um, Pinellas suensii. Um, this is also the mushroom, if I had to make a bet on the most consumed mushroom in North America that people are picking to think that they're going to have a magic mushroom experience, this is it. Because it looks sort of like the ones people think about when they think about magic mushrooms, but it is not psychoactive at all. Um, but it is a really kind of cool one to see just because it is so ubiquitous. Um, the way you differentiate this from those ones that people are looking for um, is that the spore print on this has a brownish color to it, where most of those ones that have the psychoactive components are either going to be jet black or a kind of purpley brown color. Um, the other one that we see in just huge, huge numbers in our lawns, but it's really cool because it will do what it's named after is the fairy ring mushroom. This one will fruit in these giant fairy rings. And with that, what you're seeing is you're seeing the mycelial mat, you're seeing the far edges of it are all fruiting at once. This is an edible mushroom. It's white on the gills. It will produce a creamy spore print. And it has what we call an umbo on the cap, a little kind of nipple look on the cap. Um, and these love fruiting right at our fall, spring, uh, or not fall, spring, our summer to fall transition. Uh, Damon? Yeah. Uh, Damon, hi. Okay, um, we need to take a short pause here for those people who are going to uh, leave us at eight. But we'd love okay. to ask you if you can stay in and, and uh, continue uh, in about five minutes. Would that be, would that work? Yep, that so works. I can kind of uh, speed it up and get to um, our kind of really interesting ones right at the end. That's um, cool. So Loratomyces series. This is one from New Zealand, Australia that we have, and it's all over Lake Merritt. Come the winter time, you see these red mushrooms coming up out of landscaping. That's Loratomyces series. And so it is one of our accidental imports. Um, one of our psychedelic mushrooms, those ones that have those psychoactive components, the Lake Merritt is Psilocybe alani. This one is interesting just because it was, it just got a species name in the last, I think like seven years and actually was identified by somebody that lives here in Oakland. Um, and so this is one where molecular data and microscopy data helped us identify a new species, which is kind of, this should clue you into how much we don't know, right? Because this sort of mushroom, magic mushrooms, people are probably really interested in. And the fact we didn't even have names for those means that when you get to those ones that don't have any, you know, human use immediately, the chance that those have right names is even smaller than. Um, these ones occur in wood chips. They will stain blue after, you know, 14, 15 minutes after touching them. They have caramel caps and they've got kind of, you can usually see the gills through the edge of the cap on these. These will have purplish brown spore prints on them, but pretty ubiquitous in most urban areas in the East Bay once you hit uh, November through about January. Uh, Copernelus mycelis, the mica cap. This is one that you will also see when you have a dead or dying tree. This is my indicator species for, oh, I'll say goodbye to that tree because it's got two or three years left. These guys are cool because they do what we call deliquescence. They basically self-digest themselves, become these black little blobs of drips, and they use that to attach their spores to things walking by and get their spores distributed. Uh, Copernophis lagopus, the hare's foot ink cap, very similar, comes up really quickly kind of goes to that deliquescence, can also kind of trade its spores out very fast onto people walking by. Hyphaloma uh, fesculera, the sulfur tuft is one of our strongly UV fluorescent mushrooms, i.e. you hit it with a black light at night and you are all of a sudden in a disco. It is super bright and it just shines back light at you in a completely different spectrum than what you hit it with. Um, this one loves to break down wood and so you'll find it in wood chips or you'll find it next to dead and dying uh, plants. The cabbage parachute mushroom is also one we will find a lot of time in landscaping wood chips. It has the name cabbage parachute because it smells like cabbage. If you pick it up and you scrunch it and smell it, it smells like somebody just ate cabbage and then farted in your face. Um, and so it is a really easy one to remember once you've smelled it once, you're like, I know that mushroom. I do not need to put that back by the nose. Um, the most ubiquitous one that we have in our wood chips though is the scruffy twiglet tubaria for Cacracia. Um, the easiest way to tell this apart from everybody else is that it, a lot of times on the rim of the cab veil remnants, so you can see it in that center photograph, it's got those veil remnants, and you can see striations on the cap. Um, they usually have an orangish color, a slight orangish color to them. 
are some of our kind of more polypore looking things or things we'll shelf out on trees. We have the false turkey tail. We also have true turkey tail at Lake Merritt. We get Lapista nuda, the bluet. This is an edible mushroom that some people will cultivate on um, leafy debris. They have the most intense purple color you will ever see in, in the natural world if you can find a young one. They also smell like orange juice concentrate. And I know that sounds like a weird statement, but when you find one, smell it and you'll go, oh yeah, now I see why people call, say that. It does have this weird fruity, but sort of sweet scent to it that's odd. Lactarius rubidus is our candy cat mushroom. This one is one that people will use in cookies and in baked goods because it produces maple-like scents and flavors. So it's one that I use to make uh, beer with, to add it, to add a sweet flavor to beer without adding a sugar to it. I make cookies with it, um, but you can find this in oak trees all around Oakland, including Lake Merritt. We have another one at Lake Merritt called the um, Rufus Candy Cap. And we've usually called this Lactarius rufulus, but this is actually one of the ones that in the community sequencing project that we call Barcode the Lake. Somebody did some sequencing on this. And we realized really quickly that this doesn't match any Lactarius rufulus in existence. So this is probably a new species that somebody could work up in a paper to have a new name. Um, Bark of the Lake is a small project I've been kind of running for the past couple of years and that kind of imploded due to the RNC closing. And we tried to do it in coffee shops and then we're trying to get it back up and going. But the idea is to slowly go through Lake Merritt and start generating DNA barcodes of everything that's there so that we not only have the visuals of them, but we have molecular data that points to the identity of that organism. We have rare mushrooms at Lake Merritt, Schizophyllum amplum. It has only been seen two times in North, three times in North America actually now, one of them being Lake Merritt. Uh, all of our poplar trees there, it's originally from Europe. Uh, we have Spherobolus uh, stellatus, the cannonball fungus. It's this little tiny fungus, but it can shoot its little spore package six meters. Uh, you'll find this on wood chips in the winter. Scleroderma, forget it. Pazyza, these are the cup fungi that if you blow on them, they will smoke like crazy. These um, are very ubiquitous in the Lake Merritt Gardens, usually at like peak winter, December, January. We also have rust fungi, of course. You can find those during the summers around Lake Merritt. These are fungi that use various plants as part of their life, life cycle. They will infect them, cause these little blisters. Those blisters then send out spores that land on a different species of plant usually, infects them in a different way. Um, but you can find tons of these, but you do have to get that macro lens out to see them. Okay, some of the really bizarre ones. These are the ones that before I started seeing them at Lake Merritt, I always thought I had to go to the tropics to see them. One of these I've accidentally, and well, accidentally intentionally started culturing at my place and I lived at Lake Merritt, so that's why it's gonna be in the slide deck because I do find it at Lake Merritt, the fly death fungus. This fungus, the spores land on a fly, it gets into the fly and it takes over their nervous system. It knocks out their wings so they stop flying and the fly gets what we call summit disease. It will crawl up whatever it can find to get as high as it can and then it will more or less bite onto that substrate. As it does that, the fungus then emerges from the body and shoots spores out all over the place to infect other flies. So it literally turns them into a zombie, right? Takes over their brain, tells them where to go. Once they get there, completely kills them and then shoots spores out all over the place. Um, it's pretty cool. I brought one home 2014. And now every year I have zombie flies that show up in April in my apartment. And But you can also see these around Lake Merritt using April. They'll be on the outer edges of trees, usually on leaves about head height um, on the outer edges. We also have one that does this to spiders as well at Lake Merritt, um, a gabellia species. This one is still unidentified. I sent it up to OSU. And so I think some people are gonna work on sequencing this. I'm, I can almost guarantee you this is a new species, um, but on some of our oak trees, you will find these. Spiders crawl up to about chest height and they grab on and then these mushrooms just kind of emerge from them and shoot spores all over the place. And usually when you find one, check the rest of that tree, there's usually 20 plus infected spiders all over the tree. Crazy, right? You, th you think you have to go to the Amazon to see this stuff. It is at Lake Merritt. Um, we also have another infective or one that goes after insects. Uh, this is a common one you can find all over North America, which so it's not too surprising you can find it at Lake Merritt. Flip over a rock, you find beetles that are infected with this white fuzz. Um, this is Bavaria, probably Bacina. Um, it is very, very well known for being a soil fungi that then attacks insects to get nitrogen out of them. 
Last one of the night, save the STD for the last, the sexually transmitted disease of ladybugs. Um, this is an odd one. Uh, this is one I would have never never known it wasn't for basically iNaturalist. I took a picture of ladybugs. Somebody was like, what's that on the back? I think that's this thing. I looked it up and I was like, oh my God, this is incredible. So ladybugs have STDs that they trade by accident, of course, to each other um, as they mate. The, it, doesn't in, it doesn't cause death and it doesn't seem to decrease fitness on them. But what it will do is you'll see all these little yellow sticks, more or less, or sacks hanging off the back. And that is the fungus. Hesperomyces virescens is what we, what we usually call this one. However, though, um, folks at Harvard had me send a bunch of these. They did sequencing on them, and this is getting written up into a paper. This is going to actually be described as a new species, you know, this collection plus a whole bunch from uh, Western North America. But if you go and you see lakes at Lake Merritt, look at their butts, and if you see yellow on their back, they've got that STD. Wild. Pretty easy to find uh, during the summertime. In fact, I think I just saw a couple of these two weeks ago. Um, so they're out there right now. Um, with that, I will open it up for, let me stop the share. There we go. Let's get right. Um, yes, please um, raise your hand or write, write in chat. Yeah, go ahead, David. You can pick uh, your questions. I was gonna say, were, were there any questions you guys saw right away you wanted me to jump after? Otherwise I will start trying to Go the giant chat list. Um, I saw a couple of questions in the chat earlier. Um, Joy had a question about uh, whether mushrooms have a central nervous system. Okay. So mushrooms do not have a central nervous system, um, but don't discount their ability to feel the environment and react to it, right? Just in the same way that we've learned plants, don't have a central nervous system, but they can do all kinds of interesting things like you know, airborne communication to each other. So a really great example is um, Artemisia tridenta, the white sage that we see in California. If it's getting an attack, it will shoot out a chemical signal that can tell all the other plants around, hey, I'm being eaten. Turn on your alkaloids, make yourself not tasty. And I'm sure fungi are doing that as well. In fact, when we talk about mycorrhizal species, they're definitely trading information back and forth over long distances. There's what some people have dubbed the uh, wood wide web, which is this interconnection between fungi and plants that then learn how to trade carbohydrates and information around so that the entire kind of stand of the trees get to grow better, which means the fungi still have places to grow and things to exploit. Um, any other questions people saw that came up in the chat that you would like me to grab? Uh, David, I have a couple here. Yeah. Uh, three of them, in fact, uh, but here they go. Why do we like to eat mushrooms? Why do we like to eat mushrooms? That's, I mean, it's a, it's a good question, but you could ask the same of anything. Why do we like to eat anything? And it usually comes down to okay. that there's some sort of cultural history around it, right? Mm -hmm. So if you go and you look at different um, groups or histories of people, there are some groups that are really gung-ho about fungi and some groups that are not, right? Um, and fungi are a great source of easy food and proteins. And once you learn which ones are safe, just like once you learn what plants are safe, they can be an immense source of food. And so I think one of the easiest kind of contrasters there is if you look at the UK, Traditionally, people there haven't been interested in fungi and the United States inherited some of that. And that's because they've got a couple really deadly fungi there. And so it just became taboo, like don't eat those things. Those are toadstools, they're full of poison. However, though, look at a different culture, look at China, especially like Yunnan province in China. And I mean, mushrooms are everywhere in the culture and the cuisine. And so it just comes down to cultural histories around learning to use them as a food source, as a medicine source, et cetera. And it's interesting to see America starting to change because we inherited that UK perspective of fungi where everybody was like, oh, mushrooms, scary. But that tide, I would say, started to change over the last four decades. And I, it's really ramping up right now as people become more and more interested in them. And from, a, and from a medicine point of view, from a biotech point of view, fungi are really interesting because they 
they have this ecological niche that not many things are doing. So they've got all of these novel evolutionary products, enzymes and pathways that have built to you know, figure out how to break things down or move this to over there. And we're just starting to learn about those. And so there's a lot of biotech companies right now kind of coming online that their main goal is to figure out how to exploit this taxonomic kingdom to figure out what tools could we get from fungi to then make things humans want. And it's that's blowing up really, really fast. So in the Bay Area, there's like a group making leather from fungi. There's people making different types of food products from fungi. Like there's a pet food, wild earth foods that you can buy that is the protein all comes from fungi. And so your dog could be completely, I guess, vegan now by feeding it fungi that it actually likes to eat. The dogs actually like it. I've, I've eaten it, it's actually pretty good. Um, there's all kinds of like interesting, crazy things going um, as far as the biotechnology side of fungi as well. Damon, yeah. are, there, are there any um, medicines that have resulted um, from uh, compounds made by fungi um, in, you know, to like in the bacteria, they have, they have um, chemicals that help them, um, you know, compete with other species there that for a common resource. I mean, fungi have only, I don't know, produced the most important medical finding of the last hundred years. So mm -hmm. antibiotics. Um, yeah, yeah. Penicillin came from Penicillin, a fungus, and of it's, course. Yeah. And it's from their warfare with bacteria, right? Because they're mm -hmm. called competing over the same food. And so, I mean, antibiotics are just the tip of the iceberg mm -hmm. when it comes to what we're going to get out of fungi uh, because they do so many novel ecological roles. And we're just mm -hmm. starting to uncover those through sequencing, through learning how to culture them, and things like that. Yeah. And even some of these ones that we consider like toxic, right? You gotta remember toxins are great biological tools because sometimes you don't want things to live. You don't want cancer cells to live, right? So actually understanding and identifying toxins can be very, very helpful. Phallotoxins, alpha amanita toxins are used a lot in biological studies because it allows us to pause different biological processes to then study them. And some of these have become, I, I believe pharmaceutical products as well, some of these toxins. Um, applied in certain ways, not the alphas or the, or the phallotoxins, but other ones. Um, I see we have questions coming into the chat as we speak. Uh, I did have a quick question, I believe. Uh, I'm trying to understand the distinction between a mushroom or a fungi and, and what I consider to be a truffle, which is sort of a chocolate sweet thing that I eat. <laughs> So fungi is the, is the taxonomic group where you find, find organisms that produce mushrooms. And mushrooms are just the fruiting bodies of different types of fungi. Truffles, the nice chocolate truffle, gets its name from the truffle that's underground that people like to actually eat, um, which is a fungus. Um, so colloquially, the name truffle refers to kind of anything that's underground. It's a, a fruiting body underground. But really, when you think about the delectable truffle, there's just a handful of species that actually that name applies to, which are ascomycetes. When you pull them out, they smell really nice. That's why pigs like them. They put out some of the pheromones that pigs like. And to us, they have just these flavors that we just don't find any place else. And so I think it was the fascination with those that when people started getting chocolate and making stuff with it, and they were kind of like, making these up, they're like, oh, that reminds me of the other thing that's amazing to eat, a truffle. Let's just call them the same thing. Uh, Damon, Peggy has a, a interesting question. Um, uh, what are the, uh, how has climate change affect, um, affected mushrooms? And um, yeah, what, um, what changes um, that are being made might affect humans? So with climate change, we are seeing, not too surprisingly, like a northward migration of some species. So Christian Schwartz, uh, one of the guys that wrote the Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast book, has kind of a, a soft study going on right now of a mushroom that we traditionally see only in Southern California, Chlorophyllum moldides, the uh, green parasol. So it looks kind of like our shaggy parasol, except it has kind of a green tent to the gills, and it, it's also known as the sickener. It makes you just feel horrible if you eat it. Um, and we're slowly, I think, seeing that creep up from Southern California up towards the Bay Area. And I assume that in the next five to 10 years, it'll be completely established here and it'll move even further northward. So we're seeing species migration northward, just as one would predict. 
Um, what we are seeing then too is means um, that we lose species because all of a sudden that species geography is moving north, which means at some point that bottom portion of the geography is now above where we are. And what just happened in the Santa Cruz mountains may have been a big event where we lost the southern biogeography for a lot of species because that was one of the largest dense stands right of redwoods and when that burn happened we may have lost some of those mycorrhizal species that are there so there's mycologists or community scientists um, like Christian that are studying this very intently right now to figure out did we just see a big expiration of event yes uh, Damon I got my sister Kim here with us and she has a question yeah. Hello. Hello, Damien. My name is Kimberly and I have a dog and I'm always concerned about walking her around the lake if it's unsafe for her to eat at the grass or the mushrooms that are there. Good question. So around Lake Merritt, there's only a handful of mushrooms I think you really have to be worried about with your dog. The death cap, not surprisingly, not good for you, not good for the pup. So if you see death caps, stay away from those. The other one though that dogs seem to go after, which is toxic, it doesn't usually lead to death, but it usually leads to really difficult complications is scleroderma. So I have it in the slide deck. I went through it really quickly, but it's just this round nugget of a mushroom. And if you cut it in half and it's mature, it's got kind of dark purplish spores on the inside. That one- right. Dogs seem to like, and it does make them really, really sick. Um, that being said, if your dog ever eats a mushroom and you're like, I can't identify this, I need somebody to do it, there is all of there's something called the um, Emergency Poison Consultants Group. I'm part of that. You literally can submit a uh, photograph, and there's people all around the world identifying it, usually within two to three minutes for you. But it's really only for emergencies where you know your dog or you or somebody has ingested yes. something. Got you. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Yeah. Can we, uh, we got time to catch some of these out of the chat? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, Want me yes. to read them? Okay, I, I can't quite get the order then. I won't get them necessarily in the order, but uh, are mushrooms carnivorous like the Venus flytrap? Good, good question. I. Let's see here. I'm not aware of any ones that have like a Venus like flytrap sort of like I caught my insect and I'm going to eat it situation. But we definitely do have those ones that are eating insects, right? The fly death mushroom, right. that Gabellia one around the lake, it's eating the, the spiders. And the reason they're going after them is because fungi need nitrogen and insects are great sources of nitrogen. Actually, a really cool one that we can't see it eat things, but that every a lot of people eat is the oyster mushroom. I grow them at home just from like my kitchen scraps. So this is some from like some artichoke leaves. I just grew in an old coffee bag. Um, they eat small worms called nematodes. They have these really crazy little circular three cell circles they'll make. And when a nematode swims through it, the cells swell and trap the nematode and then the mushroom gets to 10 more or less. And so tons of fungi prey on other organisms to get nitrogen. Uh, can you speak to how mushrooms uh, relate to the development of antibiotics? Sure. So from, a, from an evolutionary point of view, fungi and bacteria have usually been trying to take over similar ecological niches. And so they've gone through sort of a biochemistry warfare over evolutionary time, which is how can I produce compounds that stop the other critter from eating what I want to eat? And so fungi have produced a series of compounds that we call antibiotics that can inhibit bacterial growth or it can kill them. Um, and so it's just been, you know, literally millions, one millions of years of evolution that we've, that they've produced these things. And we've just barely started to scratch the surface of all the different compounds that they produce to stop bacteria or manipulate bacteria. Sometimes they might actually want to help a bacteria grow someplace to then get some benefit out of them. So it's not just a, I'm always gonna be fighting you. I might want to maybe grow you, maybe culture you, you know, it's, it's a give and take. You gotta remember like a lot of biology vocabulary came out of this very us versus them dynamic. And when you start kind of digging in to see what's going on in the ecological system, 
symptoms, it's usually not that clear. You know, there's a lot of give and take, a lot of wrangling of different things going on. Can you uh, speak to the impact of climate change on? I, I think we did that one. We talked about some of these species biogeographies that we're seeing move northward. I know around Lake Merritt, I mean, we get drought years and all of a sudden you don't see mushrooms, right? And if we get drought years long enough, I wonder how many of these, their spores that are laying dormant expire. And all of a sudden now they're not at Lake Merritt anymore. And I have to go to the forest and bring some back to Lake Merritt. You know, it's, it, it is happening. Um, how are they affected by salinity? We have a, are there any that get down to the water's edge? Oh yeah, there's definitely fungi that grow at the water's edge. In fact, I guarantee you, if you pull, pull up some of that pickle weed and take some of the roots and mm. throw it on auger, you'll oh. find fungi on those roots. In fact, I know somebody in Southern California that just did that this past month and he's got mm. a weird fungus we're trying to sequence now. Um, so there are definitely fungi down there in that high salinity. There are fungi in the water um, they're not producing mushrooms for the most part, right? These are those ones that are the microscopic fungi, but they're, fungi are ubiquitous in marine environments. Um, they're all over the place. However, the, the one that always gets the most kind of fanfare for being an underwater fungi is in Oregon, there is one that produces mushrooms underwater. There's a satharelia that fruits in the Rogue River only underwater, which is really kind of wacky and bizarre. Yeah. But. That is. Man. So we were weeding at the Rotary Nature Center. Uh, we pulled out a whole bunch of, um, it was Bermuda grass, I think it was. And um, somebody thought they found um, some beginning morels under this huge mat of, of grass that was there. Is that a possibility? It is a possibility. We do have a morel that occasionally shows up um, around Lake Mare, which is known as the blonde morel, uh, Morcella brunea. Um, and it's one that it will fruit any time of year where it gets enough moisture and warmth. And so, I mean, I've seen it in the Bay Area this month all the way to January. It's, it just, it's just kind of the right mix of warmth and wet and it, and it will fruit. It's usually found in landscaping areas. It is a, a morel that decomposes litter, unlike the morels that California is famous for, which are the fire morels. So after a large forest fire, we have morels that will basically bloom in like just horrendous numbers. And what we think is going on there is that these morels, these fire morels are probably mycorrhizal maybe for portions of their life with fir trees. And then once a fire comes through, they're like, oh, my host is dead. I need to get out of here. How am I gonna get out of here? I'm gonna put up a fruiting body and get my spores out into the wind and hopefully I can go land by another fir tree. Um, some of that is still being figured out. So that's kind of, it's still at the hypothesis level, um, but really interesting dynamic kind of life cycles mm -hmm. some of these systems do. Yeah. No species is an island for sure. <laughs> yeah, and actually since we're on the, on the um, concept of fire and fungi, mm -hmm. um, California has some fungi that have developed really unique structures to deal with living in fire ecology. So some of them pr um, produce what we call sclerotia. So they'll produce these really dense knots of tissue underground. And that is so that if you have a fire come through, what they can do is they can really quickly take all of that you know, body mass and then quickly put up a, a fruiting body to take advantage of that open space. And that sclerotia, a lot of times because of the density of it too, can you know, protect them against changes in temperature and stuff like that. And you really only see these type of mushroom in places that have long evolutionary histories of fires. So California, Florida, mm -hmm. and Australia have a number of these sclerotia forming fungi. Mm -hmm. Wow. Damon, this has been super wonderful. Um, we need to ask you back again <laughs> in a few months. Um, and and we're, I'm happy to, um, I'm, I'm happy to stay open as long as, as um, we, you and, and people in the audience would like to stay open. We want to run a couple of, um, of our closing slides. It'll take about three yep. minutes. And, but um, they're kind of important because we're going to thank some people. So, um, and let's see. Yeah, so I'm gonna go to my, get in to present. Oh, shoot. Okay, that was not, 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 um, uh, Hot city here. Okay, let's go again. Um, mm 
Thank you. Okay. Okay, well, we'll just go this way. Okay, it's just not open for me, so I'm not going to worry about it. Okay, so just wanted to um, thank everybody who comes out and cleans up some of uh, the detritus um, at Lake Merritt. And of course, our heroes are the Lake Merritt Institute, um, who have been doing it for since 1995, I believe, um, taking all kinds of trash and also uh, just all kinds of things out of the lake that um, spoil water quality. And we want to remind everybody that tomorrow is the second Saturday and Tony uh, will be meeting all comers at the uh, Mud Lab at 9 a.m. with coffee, pastries, a safety talk, and a chance to clean Lake Merritt. And then I wanted to share this one. Yeah, I wanted to say the biggest thank you to Damon. And I've just selected a few slides of um, some of my memories of, of working with Damon, most generous person. Um, such so much knowledge. I thank you so much, Damon, for coming in and sharing all your knowledge with us. And um, we have some upcoming talks that you we're hoping you're going to uh, want to attend as well. Um, and we'll send out a the links to all the people who um, have subscribed here today. Um, and in August, um, we have Susan Schwarzenberg and um, Sean Lani, who are from the um, Bay Observatory, and they're going to talk about. Um, a, uh, an observatory is a place to connect both nature and people together in, in the landscape. Um, and then, uh, so here we go. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that one. Um, I want to thank our producer, the media producer, Rob Lamone, um, and um, everybody in our group who's been, um, it's a team effort for sure. Um, the Lake Merritt Institute um, and for their support and the uh, Elks Lodge in San Francisco. All of our volunteers and again, our volunteers, the Hart Foundation, um, many people who have helped us um, over the last year or two. Um, our mission is to um, advocate for the Rotary Nature Center in Lakeside Park delivering interpretive nature and science programs for everyone. And um, we hope to um, see you back again um, at a lakeside chat. Uh, really appreciate your coming here tonight. And I will um, go back to the, the main um, group, all the group together. Damon, would you say 30 now? Um, do we have more questions at this point? And if people send questions, could we send them to you um, to send out answers? Yeah, of course. If you get questions in later, um, I would be happy to, to go through and answer those. Um, um, I can hang out um, for, I think I've got commitments not until like 9.30 or so. So if people have questions, I can hang out until people kind of start exiting and, and it looks like numbers are small and then I can then I'll bounce. So if you got questions, yeah. them out. All right. Okay, but if we're going to do that, let's say that uh, people are welcome with their burning questions, but let's do a formal good night for those that are uh, who have uh, been so kind to be with us this time. And uh, thank you so much, Damon, for such an thank awesome you, everybody. Uh, it was presentation. Good night, everybody. <laughs> did, you, did, you list, did you list and name each and every one of the 150 different types of mushrooms there at Lake Merritt? But uh, that's awesome. And uh, this, so it's, those a, it's a community project anytime. No. Those of you who have to leave, we want to thank you for coming, and we hope to see you next month. Absolutely. Um, more questions? Um, please let's uh, please unmute, mute yourself, and um, you can raise a real a uh, real hand, or you can just ask your question. Um, yeah, I'm just amazed, Damon, at how how you're able to organize all this information in your mind about the species you encounter on a walk. And, um, you know, it's just- Well, I, mean, I, I use giant crutches for it. Like I use my naturalist, I use knowing people like you, knowing people like Alan Rockefeller for fungi, Eddie for insects, yes. right? Nobody knows, nobody knows everything on their own. It's, mm -hmm. it's literally community knowledge. And I happen to be good at like describing that community knowledge for other people sometimes. Awesome, so, yes, we really appreciate it. Um, just, I remember finding um, one of the uh, 
the stinky um, geodesic dome mushrooms. That was one of my first mushrooms. I never paid much attention to them, you know, and that was quite a revelation. And they're, they're really crazy. And that, that, that seems like there's a lot that are brought in by human activity now at the lake. I mean, lake community has changed a lot over the years with, um, you know, with people bringing things in and, and all the um, landscaping, et cetera. Um, what are you talking to? Uh, oh, Damon. Really, Damon. Really, I may be going on too long, yes. <laughs> I was going to say, it brings up a really interesting point, Katie, which is when you walk around Lake Merritt or downtown Oakland, you're seeing an environment that has selected for mainly saprotrophic fungi, ones that eat dead stuff. So if we were to go into the Oakland Hills, we'd find, I would say, more of an equal footing for those mycorrhizal ones. Where, but because of all the disturbance humans just do by being humans, we end up selecting for all these saprophytic species. So that's why a good portion of the ones that we saw in the slide talk were ones that aren't in association with plants. They're typically breaking down wood or breaking down grass. Um, you know, so that's why when we do see mycorrhizal fungi around Lake Merritt, I'm always like, ooh, wow, that's amazing. You know, something's getting to like hold on to a tree root here. That's great to see. Have you had any pop-ups um, looking at mushrooms? I know you, you've done a lot of them with looking at, um, at you know, like marine organisms, but has that been uh, something you've ever I've, thought of? I've done two like guided mushroom walks at Lake Merritt before, um, and it usually will happen during the, during the winter. Um, I think it's been probably about four years since I've done one just because our winters have been really, really poor um, as far as kind of rain, rain goes at the lake. I think 2017 was the last year that was like really fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a walk that year. So if we do get a good rain year, I will get one on the schedule again. Uh, mm -hmm. because we can usually find, you know, 30 plus species easily within uh, an hour or walk. I think I was lucky enough to go on one of them. It was pretty spectacular. Okay. Um. Hey guys, my mother passed by and asked a question that I don't know if it's on topic, but she passed by a moment ago and asked me uh, if what Damon thought about the um, California state legislator passing a mushroom law. A mushroom and I think she was referring to uh, something related to the psychedelic uh, the opportunity uh, to uh, examine psychedelic properties of plants and uh, put yeah. them to purposes or something. I mean, it's it's one that Oakland has already more or less passed, right? Oakland had decriminalized um, all plant and fungi that produce more or less psychoactive components. And so right here in this town, we're all already there. I'm I'm always for more choices than less choices, you know, as long as there is like a, appropriate regulation um, on those things. And to be honest, I mean, the history of like psychedelic mushrooms tells me that they're a lot less dangerous than alcohol is. Um, and so I would pretty much actually much rather have them around than, than alcohol as readily available as it is. Uh, so I think, it's a, I think it's a great move, but it's like anything, right? Things can look good on paper, but it really comes down to the execution of the plan, how it rolls out, people's access, the regulation, things like that, that's important. And from the studies, if you've read the studies, I mean, the studies are pretty compelling that these compounds that you can find in magic mushrooms, the uh, psilocybin, do allow for changes in neurology that can really help patients, especially those with PTSD and similar sorts of, um, problems because it gives them a chance to more or less rewire or be more susceptible to counseling and things like that. Wow. I, I was personally curious as to why amongst organisms, uh, fungi seem to be so prolific around the planet. Is there, or I could be wrong that they are, but my sense is that they are. And is there a yeah. reason why they're so much more successful than other organisms or so? Um, I think it's because they are, have been very successful at developing novel pathways here or, or take advantage of ecological niches other things weren't. And so I think that's part of their ability to end up everywhere. And 
they're one of the ones that when you look at them, they've learned to work with other species, right? You've got symbiosis going on that's very obvious. They can take advantage of different species. They could be a parasite and they can just eat dead stuff from another species. And so they really have kind of found the way to be at the buffet table, no matter what's going on in the environment. Um, and so I think that's part of the reason that they're so, so successful. And I mean, they're a very ancient lineage, which then has given them the evolutionary time to develop these tool sets to exploit all of these different, you know, ecological niches. Good question. Thank you. It was a good question, but it was a great answer. Damn, you have a way of uh, explaining things and putting words together that uh, really works for <laughs> Thanks for sure. yeah, let's let me talk about that that seal simon component again because that's actually an interesting one because people I, I was actually expecting that to be your follow-up question because people are like well why do mushrooms produce this thing that then cause weird neurological things to happen in mammals um well those compounds a lot of times we think they're made so that organisms don't eat them right because if you eat something and all of a sudden you start feeling really funny like that, usually as an animal, you're like, I do not want to go back to that thing. I do not want that back in my mouth. And so we call it a, an anti-herbivory component. And so that is the hypothesis why some of these fungi produce compounds like psilocybin is as a way to protect their fruiting bodies that remember are producing their spores, the way that they're going to get back out into the world from being eaten. Do the psychoactive ones also make the, you um, sick to your stomach? Um, the actual components that is the psychoactive, uh, doesn't some of them though, um, could make people feel slightly ill or nauseous, but I believe that's due to other components that are in there. Right. Cause like when you're eating a mushroom or you're eating any organism, right. You're not just eating a handful of molecules. You're eating a giant mixed bag of molecules. Do they vary in their production of these uh, psychoactive um, components in different, you know, in, at different times or different, in different situations? Yeah, and it makes biological sense when they produce it. So most of these fungi will have their highest concentration of those psychoactive components when the mushroom is just starting to come and the gills aren't mature yet and letting spores out because that is definitely the time you put all this investment in, right? To putting up this fruiting body and you don't have mature spores yet. You definitely don't want anything ruining your, you know, trajectory to the finish line. And then once you get production, those compounds start to not be produced as much. They'll still be there, but they're not as, as in high of kind of production level or rate of production. Um, so it, the really kind of cool um, biological reason, right, that those are there and it, and it matches. And then species to species um, can be very, very different. And that's probably because those different species have different ecological habitats. So there's different types of herbivores they're trying to keep from eating themselves. Um, so like some of the ones in the grasses in California, there's one plus uh, Centiculus that has a mild level of those psychedelic components, but it's not as strong as, say, um, that's the loss of the alony that was in the slide deck that we find on wood chips. And it's because one of those grows really, really fast. So it probably doesn't need to protect it as, as, as many and it throws up lots of mushrooms where the one on the wood chips grows slow. It only produces, you know, a mushrooms really, really slow and maybe a it needs to really, really protect its fruiting bodies. Or at least that's, that's a theory of why you might have those different um, of the psilocybin and psilocin being produced in them. I was wondering about mimicry of, if, of compounds, if they are sending a signal, don't eat me, um, if there might be species that would hone in on, uh, you know, as we have, you know, colors and butterflies that, um, you know, mimic uh, poisonous species, there might be, um, or, or just getting together to make the same kind of yuck smell. Yeah, so there's definitely ones that are producing compounds specifically to invite other organisms to come disperse their spores, right? So mm -hmm. Clathus rubra, that one you found, mm -hmm. it's producing a lot of the same compounds that you actually see the corp star produce, which are all the compounds that you see in a rotting carcass. So it's tricking those flies to come find it and then spread its spores. I don't know of any that, I don't know of any that, that emit things that, that tell things don't eat meat, but there probably mm -hmm. are ones out there. It just probably hasn't been 
or I haven't read the paper yet, or it hasn't been figured out yet, but I imagine that's gotta be a strategy for some fungi, but there's tons of these ones that produce compounds that attract things to come in and dig them up and then move their spores. Truffles are the like best known example of that. They produce compounds that look very similar to female pig uh, pheromones. So it drives organisms to come dig them up, you know, mm -hmm. rip them up and then spread their spores all over the place. Um, and you see that with a lot of the other, um, even kind of truffle-like species, these underground ones, they'll produce compounds that will um, bring rodents through to dig them up um, and pull them up and, you know, run off with them. And a lot of these, even if you cut them and you find them, like a lot of the ones we have in the Bay Area, these rhizopogons, as they get mature, if you cut them and smell them, I mean, even to our nose, they've got this very kind of like strong, like sense where you'll be like, wow, that is, why would you make this smell? It's to attract somebody to come and move your spores around. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, oh, go ahead, if anybody else wants to answer the question. Um, the zombie flies, if, in, if any of these psychoactive drugs might be influencing behavior in a way that would spread spores or? So we, we do have one really well pop sci version of this that's been spread all around in these last two years, which is there is a fungus that attacks cicadas um, and it produces Psilocybin or psilocin, I forget, and something that looks like an infed or that is an amphetamine. And so those components actually work on the neurology of the cicadas so that the fungus is literally eating their storage butt up, right? The, the backside of a cicada is a giant lipid storage vessel, more or less. The fungus is eating through that, shooting spores off, and these things are just flying around, hopped up more or less on drugs, throwing spores over the place. Um, so it's one of the best documented versions where we see these um, neurological active compounds being used for spore dispersal. And um, Mike, Mike Eisen's lab at UC Berkeley is working on the fly death fungus right now. And I think they did find some, I want to say it was an amphetamine-like compound inside that fungus. Um, and so it wouldn't be too surprising, right? Because it's, it's obviously taking over and controlling a little bit of the neurology. So amazing. <laughs> just, and just there, when you use the term neurology, you're referring to the central nervous system of a, of a plant, right? Um, in this case, of insects. So central nervous system oh, or okay. logical system of insects. And they, you know, they kind of have like a central nervous system, but it's not, it's not like ours. It's a little more spread out with nodes and stuff. Uh, but basically getting in there and, and manipulating that signaling pathway to, to take over and, and drive the organism to do what it wants. We have more questions. Yeah, I'm surprised how many people are just still hanging out on. <laughs> it's great. I mean, you know, I, it was just wonderful to hear you talk about all these, um, you know, everything that you've learned. Um, I would love to hear more. Um, okay, yeah, I wanted to explain my last question. Oh, I thought that um, uh, the reason why I asked whether you were referring to the neurology of a plant is because I was thinking that a cicada was a plant, but a cicada is an insect, correct? Right, cicada is an insect, and there are these ones that usually burrow underground for a long period of time and kind of feed on tree roots and then will emerge. And they're famous for emerging in mass numbers on the East Coast on prime number years as a way to avoid or overwhelm their predators. And so there was just a brood X bloom this year on the East Coast, which these guys have been hiding out for those 13 years. I forget what brood X is. And they just come out in mass. They're just everywhere at the same time. We have cicadas here in California but we don't have these giant balloons of them. But the easiest way to, to find a cicada usually in California is if you're walking along and you hear this high pitch, like noise in the forest, that's usually a, a cicada rubbing its you know, stuff together to put out a signal to everybody that, hey, I'm here. But they're actually pretty, I, I think they're pretty hard to see in California. Get eyes on them is hard. It's a lot easier to hear them when we're in the forest. They almost, it's almost an electrical like buzzing noise, the ones I've seen in the Oakland Hills and in the Sierras, but they are here. They're definitely here.
Okay, more questions? I, I think we may have reached um, a, a pause point here um, and would love to, um, you know, you can find, um, Damon, where can we find other talks that you might be giving that our group might want to um, hear more about? Um, I'll usually put them um, either up at calnature.org. So I'll mm -hmm. put that in the chat, uh, calnature.org. I'll put them up there. This past year, a lot of other people have me giving talks. And so maybe the easiest way to do it is if you follow me on Instagram, I'll usually post like in my stories that, hey, I'm doing a talk, you know, this Friday on this, you know, drop by and, and, and it'll be there. Um, I have a handful of these now on, on YouTube, not a ton of them. I probably even way more talks. I probably should have recorded them, um, but those are up there um, as well. Um, yeah. Well, it's been a, a, a total pleasure and, you know, we'll be following you <laughs> and maybe uh, get you back to talk about um, other critters at Lake Merritt. And yeah, yeah, that would be awesome. That would be, that would be fun, Katie. Yeah, it would be. And uh, we're definitely going to be able to get out there and do some more looking in real life, um, hopefully in the coming year, if everybody gets yeah. vaccinated and, you know things progress in a good way. Yep. And, and, thank, and thank you, Katie, for I mean, all your years of kind of keeping people interested about Lake Merritt and keeping kind of the community science component going. I mean, without you, there would have been just so many years of lost information that we would have about the lake. And then all of those on your team too, just do such a great job of like collecting it and organizing it and getting other people excited about it. That like, I mean, what you guys are doing with Lake Merritt is just fantastic. So, I mean, thank you. Well, thank you, Damon. I was, you know, you've contributed. It's just been a community effort. It is a community. And I think that's one of the real, you know, assets and treasures that Oakland has is the people and the lake together. That's just so cool. So um, everybody, I think we're, uh, it's time now to, to turn in for the night. And if anybody has a burning question you'd like to ask, let's all clap our hands and say thank you to Damon. And we'll send you, uh, we will definitely send you a post uh, Zoom a uh, note with the next Zoom that we're going to have and um, any um, information that you might like, any some of the um, references, et cetera, there, well, you'll be able to see them in the in the recorded talk as well. It should come out in about a, in about a week. We should be able to post that. So thank you so much, everyone. And Katie, it was awesome. Katie, yes, yes. I, I was going to thank you and I was going to thank uh, Tony mm -hmm. and Rob and uh, Betsy and Kirsten and Janice. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh uh, Damon did such a good job that I, I won't bother to do that. <laughs> All right. Yeah, okay. You, you did a fabulous job. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Damon. Yeah. Yep. Okay. You guys. Have a great night. And um, if you can get up in the morning, we're going to be cleaning the lake uh, with uh, the second Saturday of Mud Lab. Team. Oh yeah, we should announce that. We did. We we'll did. Be there a week yeah. from Saturday, a week from tomorrow for our third Saturday. That's right. But you tomorrow we will be joining the Mud Lab. Right. At what time, Katie? Um, nine a.m. for the Mud Lab, and then we're starting yeah. our second camp. Uh, Mud Lab there. I wish we had the address, but it's on the corner of Bellevue and Grand Avenue. Yeah, we and, gave uh, too. <laughs> free coffee. Yeah. And so, yes. Okay, everyone. Take care. Right, Have a good everybody. evening, Great, and thank thanks. you so much.